just to get things going here, um, something from nothing can I mean, here we've got a box, we can create a sort of a thought experiment, we can seal off a box, we remove everything out of it, all the radiation and particles and anything else we could say is stuff. You've got a box that's empty, is that nothing? Well, you know, that's become a big, a big question. What is nothing? I've, and in the early book, I mean, I've been debating lately with some theologians and philosophers who I point out are, are experts at nothing. And uh, um, they... Um, they've been wondering about whether empty space is nothing and I think it, it it's a version of nothing if you actually thought of what people for thousands of years thought, thought nothing was it's sort of an eternal empty void as the Bible might have said and um, and that's a good approximation of nothing of course in the modern with our modern understanding of physics we now understand that nothing is actually quite exciting it's full of it's it's actually quite complicated nothing and I and you, you, you said it perfectly you get rid of, you take a region of space, you get rid of all the particles, all the radiation, so there's no particles there, but it's still a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles popping in and out of existence at a time scale so short you can't measure them. Now that sounds like uh, philosophy, sounds like counting angels on the head of a pin or something, but it's not because although you can't see anything there, and, and in fact we argue those things are there, these virtual particles are there, we can't measure their effects directly, but we can measure their effects indirectly, and that's very important. We can, we can actually calculate how they affect the properties of materials, like the particles that make up your body. And in fact, most of the mass of all the particles in your body, the protons and neutrons in your body, is actually due to these virtual particles that are popping in and out of existence. So we can calculate that, and it's one of the greatest triumphs of the latter part of the 20th century to get the numbers right. So we know they're there. So that, then we try and say, well, what will they do to just purely empty space? And when we try and calculate what they do to pur purely empty space, you end up from the, going from the, one of the most beautiful calculations in physics to one of the worst. We predict that the energy of empty space should be roughly a gazillion times the energy of everything we see, which is the worst prediction in all of physics, so we didn't used to talk about it. And, uh, but, but in fact, we thought we knew the answer. We said, well, look, there's something wrong with our calculation, the answer's got to be zero. Because, you know, ask anyone, what's the energy of empty space? It's zero. And the big surprise is, when we go out and measure the energy of the universe by using gravity, because gravity responds to energy, we discover something remarkable. So remarkable, actually, it won the Nobel Prize this last year for the people who observed it, not the people who predicted it. But, um, uh, in any case, it is, if you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive. It's not attractive. It's, it's, uh, it, any student of physics has always learned that gravity sucks. It always pulls, it never pushes. But if you put energy in empty space, it's actually like anti-gravity. And we look at the universe, the expansion of the universe is actually speeding up. And that tells us that empty space has energy. So it tells us that nothing, that kind of nothing, has energy. And that tells us that nothing is far more interesting than we thought it was and then the next question you might ask which you may or may not ask is well is you know if, if it really has energy is that really nothing sure and and the answer is maybe um and if but i don't know if you where you want to head but in fact oh. I, in the in the book i try and make it quite clear that well okay so that kind of nothing is quite interesting because in fact what we, what we now know is that that kind of nothing is unstable. If you have purely empty space with no particles in it, the laws of quantum mechanics and relativity when you combine them with gravity will tell us that if you wait long enough, it'll fill up with stuff. And so nothing, one of the simplest answers to the question, why is there something rather than nothing, is that nothing is unstable. If you wait long enough, nothing will always become something. And you don't need any supernatural shenanigans. The laws of physics will do it. And that, to me, is profoundly fascinating. But people would point out, well, that's not nothing because you still have space. Sure. Where did the space come from? Well, it turns out, if you then apply quantum mechanics to gravity itself, gravity, general relativity tells us that space responds to the presence of matter and energy. And if you make that a quantum mechanical theory, then there are not just fluctuations of particles within space. There's fluctuations of space itself. So universes could pop in and out of existence. 
just like particles could pop in and out of existence in the universe and in fact you can create whole universes from nothing no space no time it seems to me that's a much better definition of nothing but again it doesn't satisfy some people well yeah. okay so so if you've got a space where universes can pop into existence albeit for a short yeah. time or whatever um, some presumably not for a short time, some for a long time, like our universe. In fact, if you ask what are the characteristics of a universe that popped into existence from nothing that would last long enough so you could have an Auckland Writers Festival, the characteristics of such a universe are exactly the characteristics of the universe we measure. That doesn't prove we came from nothing, but it's strongly suggestive, at least to me.